We are going to read the Bible from the book of uh, Judges chapter 7. And uh, sisters, mamas, you've done very well. The song you've sung agrees with my message. I think you were in the spirit. This way, that thing was trying to, re to refuse. But uh, it's good. Judges chapter 7 and verse 2, if you can turn there. I know it's long since I spoke. It's almost, uh, how many weeks, Pastor Joyce? Yeah. Almost four weeks since I spoke on this pulpit. We had, uh, the, yeah, so I'm, I'm feeling so blessed to stand here and minister to you. Amen. Judges chapter 7 and verse 2. The Bible says, the Lord said to Gideon. He said, the people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand. Test lest Israel should boast over me, saying, what would Israel say? My own hand has saved me, meaning they will take the glory, like the sisters have said. Instead of giving me the glory, they will think it is me that has done it, or it is my hand which has done it. So I'm calling my someone this morning, synergy is not just numbers. Can you turn to your neighbor and tell him it's not just numbers? Now do it nicely. Tell him synergy is not just numbers. Yeah, because that is the temptation we have. I know over the year, from the time the year began, we have really handled the subject of synergy so well. Everyone who has stood on this pulpit has properly elaborated it, that I can tell you confidently, every member of this fellowship now understands the meaning of synergy. And sometimes the temptation of us believing as much as we are many and we can do it, can be there. And that's what we want to look at this morning. As we enter our conference week, we have just one week to come, before we do our conference, I will be taking a series on this subject, Synergy is not just numbers. We will look at what Synergy is. Beyond numbers, there are certain things that we must do in Synergy. Shall we make a prayer? Lord, we are grateful for this morning, for the privilege and the opportunity that you've given us to gather together in this house, to worship you. I've seen faces here that, Lord, we have not met for a week, two, or three and I'm so thankful that you have kept us wherever we've been, ministries that we've been doing in different places, to the point that today we can gather and we can worship you and hear your word. I want to pray this morning, do not disappoint anyone that has come to the house. And especially we that woke up very early, we did so because we were yearning for you. We were looking for you. We did so because our hearts were, were just aspiring and looking forward to you feeding us this morning. And therefore, Lord, we are saying we are open to you. To speak to us in those areas of concern that you want us to know the areas that you need to deal with i pray this morning dear father minister to us we are ready to hear from you and bless me even as i share the word of god lord bless your people as they receive it let this word have an impact that will help us to know much more than what you want us to know we bless you and we worship you in jesus name we pray and together we say what Amen. Thank you, and God bless you. Let me first appreciate Pastor Joyce, together with her team, for wonderful delivery of the Word of God on this pulpit. Yeah, every time I've been out doing ministry out there, the first thing I do, I tune in. I tune in first, and listen to the first service. Then I follow the second and the third. And the messages from this pulpit have been awesome. I believe you've been blessed. Have you been blessed? Thank you so much. God bless everyone. Now, I want to talk about, like I've said, synergy is not just numbers. And I'll, and I'll begin by saying, the pride of synergy is in the tyranny of numbers. There's a gentleman who brought a phrase in this country called tyranny. Can you remember that phrase? Tyranny means that when you are many, you have more effect. And that young man who came up with that, I don't want to mention his name. Actually, he was a member of my, a member of my youth group, those who don't know. All right, Mutahi was a member, he can hear me, even if wherever he is, he knows me and we talk. And he came up with a phrase a few years ago, he said, tyranny of numbers. And indeed, as people picked on that phrase, it worked to some extent, right? and it, it became a kasumba in the minds of other people. So the pride of synergy is normally, normally the tyranny of numbers, meaning the moment you begin to think that we are many, there is always that pride for you to think you can make it. That's the challenge we have. And that's the challenge that is killing even ministry. Today, when we feel like our church has many people, the enemy will bring in that pride of tyranny and will begin to imagine that now we've made it. 
Sometimes we live, we live and think that we are doing better than others, which is a, actually a deception, is a lie. Is a lie. This is when people begin to say, we have made it. And that pride will always carry itself beyond. We begin to think that because we have synergized, we are so many of us, we are working together. There are so many of us who have come together. Then we are able to defeat whatever we, is coming before us. So we are able to defeat or to do the projects, to do the things that we must do. Now, this is what God was addressing in the scripture that I've read in Judges chapter 7 and verse 2. And what God was telling Israel during that time, he was simply telling them, and this is my subtopic for this, for, for this purpose. He was simply saying synergy is quality and not quantity. Then do somebody tell him it's quality and not what? You know the difference between quality and quantity? All right, I'll explain for those who don't know. Tell someone synergy is quality and not quantity. All right, that's what he was telling them. Judges 7 and verse 2. And the Lord said to Gideon, he said, The people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands. And we'll look at that. Then he said, lest Israel has the pride of tyranny. Lest Israel turns around and says, it is our own hand that has saved me. So that we, we move away from giving God the glory and we take that glory to ourselves. Now, synergy, as we, we learned a few months ago or a few years ago, is simply an interaction or the cooperation of two or more organizations or substances or other agents to produce a combined effect greater than the sum of their separate effects. Now, in that definition, there are things that many of us don't see. I think for us, we've been dwelling on the point of cooperation of two or more organizations. And that's the clarion call we've been calling. Please come, let's work together, let's work together, let's work together. That's what we've been looking at. But there is a word in that phrase that is very key and very important, which in my opinion, if you miss on that word, then this, what God was telling Gideon becomes true. And that word is the combined effect. In other words, there is something just more than the numbers. The effect is the word I'm looking for here. So in this definition is that there is an effect that each person has to bring. There is an effect that each one must have. So that the combined effect of those two produces a bigger result than the separate effects on their own. So the synergy effect can easily be confused with numbers. And that's the temptation we have. We can easily confuse that synergy works when we have numbers. We have numbers. One can be deceived to equate synergy or success to the people involved in that interaction. There's a possibility for us to confuse that our, our success is in the numbers of the people that God has given us to synergize together. And that's a deception from the devil. This is not true. It is this kind of deception that makes people link success to themselves, where we begin to say, we made it. And you'll agree with me, whether it is politics, when we have that thinking, we believe we have done it. Whether it is church, when you have that thinking, you begin to imagine it is because of our numbers that we have made it. Even in families, when you have that effect, you begin thinking it is our work that we has, has helped us to reach where we are. Then we disassociate God from the success that we have in whatever endeavor that we are doing in our lives. So I've come to the conclusion that synergy is a product of two or more effects. And put down that in your mind, effects. A product of two or more effects. The word effects there is what ends up becoming effect, effective. Effective. Please forgive me. Me, I like, I like, to, I like to teach. All right? All right. Effective. So synergy is a product of two or, or two or more effects combined to work together. To work together. Now, God wanted to teach Israel that there was just, synergy was just more than numbers. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. This happened when Israel was caught up in a very precarious condition. You remember Joshua, after he had taken, after he had taken over the land of Canaan. I think we talked about that several times. And they've conquered the land. And Joshua subdivided the land. 
They have synergized. They have gone in and taken the land. And Joshua has died. The Bible tells me Israel began going through a circle of life that was a repetitive circle of itself. Sad enough, Joshua never left a leader to take over Israel. And that's some of the mistakes that many of us do. And that's the reason why in, in this year we are very particular about raising other people. Because we believe when you don't raise people, when you don't empower people, when you don't let people do what you are doing, when you, leave away, when you move away, whatever you did disappears with you. The reason why we have a problem, not, I'm not talking about church only, even in families, even in economies like ours, even in politically, is because we are so much afraid of ourselves bringing other people to our standards. And when we see people coming up to our levels, we get threatened. And many times we push them away from us. I'm not saying that was Joshua. I'm simply trying to tell you, maybe Joshua was so much concerned by the conquering the land than raising other leaders. That to an extent that Israel comes to a position where Joshua even looks at Israel and realizes they have, they have all got, gone away from God. That he tells them, for me and my house. He says, you choose now what you want. But for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. Anyway, that's not my point. The Bible tells me Israel reached a point where no people were doing whatever was right in their own sight. Until God raised what the people we call as judges. Because at that particular moment, there was no direction. Nothing was actually happening. And every time Israel went into sin, the Lord would come and punish them. And this went on and on and on until they demanded a king. And again, that went on and went on and on and on until Christ came. Uh, for those who read the Bible, read it, from that, read it from that point. So they come to the place where now Israel is being ruled by judges. And one of those judges was a man called Gideon. I'm just sharing this to help our mind to open up to see what I'm talking about. Yeah, a man called Gideon. Gideon was one of the judges. This man Gideon came at a time when Israel was going through the most difficult moment because they had sinned against God. And God had told Israel, the moment you sin against me, I will punish you. And I'll say this to believers, even you as a believer, the moment you see God, things happening in your life, check your life. There is a possibility you are not on track. I'm not saying everything that goes wrong in your life is because you're not on track, no. But there is always a possibility that many times things come to, into our lives because we are off track. So he told Israel, listen, the moment you sin against me, I will punish you. And this was the moment now when Israel had sunk below. They had sunk so low that God decided to put them under punishment. And we can see this in Judges chapter 6, verse 1 to verse 3. And please read with me. And I hope you're following me. Are you following me? Yes. Judges chapter what? 6, verse 1 to verse 3. Now, I, I just want this to help you see where synergy now begins to develop, okay? Now, the Bible tells me, and the people of Israel did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord gave them, listen to this, the Lord gave, gave them into the hands of, of Midian for how many years? Seven years. Can you imagine in the hands of the Midians for seven years? I'm sorry to tell you this. Even some of the things we are going through in this country is because we, God has looked at Kenya and he has realized Kenyans have a problem. Are you listening to me? We have done so many bad things. We have done so many evil things that we, we just need to turn to God. But I ask the church, which is supposed to turn to God, are the same people. Okay, let me not go into politics. All right, so they were given into the hands of the Midianites for how many years? Seven years. Now listen, it keeps, keep, goes on to say, and the hand, the hand of Midian overpowered Israel because of media, because of Midian, the people of Israel made for themselves, look at what they did. They made for themselves what? Dens and what? Dens that are in the mountains and the caves and the strongholds. I want you to imagine for a moment, before I finish that portion of scripture, from houses which the Bible says they will live in which they never built, from the land which they will live in and eat plenty, according to the Bible in the book of Deuteronomy. Now these men are living in dens. You know the meaning of the word den. You can go and check in your dictionary what a den looks like. And also living in caves. It means this man, people le left their farms, their lands. And they went and dug dens and dug caves. And they began living in caves and in dens. And what the Bible calls here also, they build small walls around themselves. What the Bible calls here are strongholds. 
And the reason was very simple. Let's keep on reading. It says, for, for whenever the Israelites planted crops, what happened? The Midianites and the Amalekites and all the people of the east, they came up against them. Now, even when you planted, after the harvest is up, these men would come and they would take all the harvest and run away with it. And this happened for seven years. I'm sure if this happened to Kenya for two, for two years, some of you guys who are seated here, I think you're complaining about tax. It has not happened yet. All right? I'm not, I'm not prophesying doom. But I'm telling you, sometimes you reach a state where you just have to turn to God. If you believe it, you can say amen. amen. Sometimes God will corner us. He puts us in a place where we look back and we check our, li our lives and we realize we, need, we got off track. Now, this is where these people were. At a position where, for seven good years, this man, I've put in my notes here, I've said, Israel lived in dens and in caves and in strongholds that were in the mountains for seven years. And this was utter misery, exceeding even slavery. In Egypt, they never lived in dens. They lived in houses, believe me. In fact, in Babylon, they were even happy. By, by the way, in Babylon, Israelis were just there on holiday. And I came to realize Babylon was holiday. Those who don't know. By the rivers of Babylon. How many remember that song? There we sat down. And there we did what? As we did what? As we remembered Zion. Then what happened? Somebody came and did what? And asked us, why don't you do sing us? One of those beautiful songs that you, you, are, you are singing. And we said, how can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? But you know, if you check the Bible, there is nowhere where in Babylon, Israel was under stress. By the way, the years they stayed in Babylon, 70 years plus. The ru ruler of Babylon was one of them. And we know who he was. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego were the governors of the counties that were in Babylon. So these men were actually on holiday. But look where they are here, in their own land, but these fellows are living in utter misery. Well, I'm just bringing that to your attention. Gideon was one of the few people who understood the suffering of Israelites and questioned where God was in all this. So after God had raised Gideon, we know the story when God came to Gideon and he told him, I'm going, I, I, I have known you and you're going to be the one who will. Gideon now begins getting concerned about Israel. And he begins questioning God, where are you in this? And as he was questioning God, where are you in this? God remembered Israel. And I can tell you sometimes God looks for a man who will stand in the gap and begin to question, Lord, where, where are we in this state? He's looking for people in the church who instead of us politicking, we can ask God, where are we? What is our, our, our position in this matter? Or what is your position in this matter? The Bible tells me God had to send an angel to Gideon to address the situation. I'm moving fast so that I got my, my point. Synergy is not just in numbers. Are we together? Now, look, go to Judges chapter 6, verse 11 to verse 13, and see what happens when God has raised Gideon as the judge over Israel. Number chapter 6, verse 11, Judges 6, 11. It says, now the angel of the Lord came and sat under Terabith, Terabith was a tree, at Oprah, okay, which belonged to Joash, the, Ab the Abrizite, while his son Gideon was doing what? Look at what his son Gideon was doing. Gideon was, help me here. He was threshing, threshed wheat in the wine press in order to do what? To hide it from who? Now you can imagine, even when you are threshing your wheat, you are cooking your bread, you are cooking when you are actually checking out who is coming. And he was, this man is, is, is actually uh, threshing the wheat, removing from the maganda. He's like preparing wheat. And he is actually hide, doing it to go and hide it because he knows if he doesn't hide it, some characters will come. Look, I'm just painting a situation for you to see it. Today we are not talking about wheat, we are talking about money. Today we are talking about things that actually you live on. Where the enemy will come for them. Where the enemy will try to take them away from you. So this man here is afraid. And as Gideon is doing that, he's doing it with the hope that he can go and hide that wheat for them to have something to eat on because the enemy will come. To give you a picture, for seven years, this was the trend of what was going on. And as he was sitting there doing whatever he was doing, an angel was sitting under, the, under a tree somewhere 
where, we, where the Bible has mentioned. So the angel had been sent by God to go and check out on the situation and then take action. And I want to tell somebody here, there is an angel that is checking on what is happening in your life. You're not giving me a good amen. There is somebody whom God has sent who is sitting somewhere. Me, I believe this angel was just like a man sitting there. So people thought maybe Gideon or this man thought he was just another brother who has come from nowhere and is just resting under a tree. But the angel was checking and he saw Gideon sitting there. And Gideon is threshing the sand, I mean threshing the wheat. And in the heart of Gideon, there is a question. He's wondering, why, how long will this situation be with us? Gideon is wondering, what, what is God doing about this situation? And if you keep reading, you will realize, the Bible tells me, while his son Gideon was there, okay, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, and read with me, he said, the Lord is with you, almighty man of valor, we like that. He says, and Gideon said to him, look at the response of Gideon. He says, oh my, that, that Bible says what? That one says, huh? Can you say that as though you mean it? <laughs> oh my God. Let's keep on reading. Yeah. Oh my God. If the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? Where are all these miracles? Where are all his miracles which our fathers told us about? Saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of who? That is a heart of a desperate person. I'm trying to imagine when he saw the angel and the angel has spoken, he went, oh my God, oh my God. This is the way this man is responding. And he's questioning where, the, where about is God. He's asking God, where, where are you in this situation? This man is desperate. If you give me an opportunity, I'll get out of this desperate, I mean, out of this situation. And in the process, the Bible tells me, as Gideon was speaking, the Amalekites, as he was questioning, Amalekites and the Midianites, and the people from the east of Jordan, when they say the east, they're talking about people from beyond the Amorites, beyond the, beyond the, beyond who? Now it's not the Amorites living in that place. Beyond the Manasseh and the God, and beyond who? East of the Jordan, who settled there? Reuben, Manasseh, and God. Beyond those countries, people from the east, that is now those people who come from Iraq and the other side. They were gathering together under the league of the Midians to come and attack. You can just put it off my sister, Joyce. To come and attack and take away that little thing that Gideon was trying to hide away. Now, look at chapter 6, verse 33, it says. 33, it says, And all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people from the east came together and they crossed the Jordan and then camped in the valley of Jezreel. And they were not few. You may, you may take this, when we read our Bible, we read it as though it is a casual reading. There were not few men. There was a great army of the Midians, a great army of the Amalekites. And all the countries from the east, they came together and they went and camped under the valley of the Jordan called Jezreel. Okay? And as they were camping there, there were not few. You can find how many they were in chapter 8, verse 10. Can we go to chapter 8, verse 10? Judges 8, 10. It gives us the number here. Read with me. What does it say? Now Zeba and Zelmuna were in Korkor with their army. About how many people? 15,000. All men, all who were are, who, who are left of all the army of the people of the east. For there they had fallen how many people? 120,000 men who drew the sword. So you add 15 to 120. How many people are there in the valley? 135,000. Those figures are very key for you to understand. God synergy is not in numbers. Very important. If you miss that, you will just see. You know, when I read the Bible, no, I can just see Gideon killing people. No, no, no. Synergy is not in numbers. It's not in numbers. Now, these men were the ones camped down there. They had come together and they wanted now to attack because I want to believe it was a season when Israel had, had just harvested. The barley, as we have seen, the wheat was in the fields. And as we have read before, they were making an assault again to go and take the wheat which these men had 
actually planted and the barley which they had planted to make, they were not killing them, they were assaulting them and, 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 and just messing them up. And this is the time when Gideon is asking, God, asking the angel, why has the Lord forsaken us? Now let's go now to my point here. Now the Bible tells me, as soon as that happened, this is when now Gideon made what I'm calling here a synergy call. Because the Lord had already spoken to Gideon and told Gideon, Gideon, you great man of valor. So Gideon makes a clarion call. And, and it didn't just happen. The Bible tells me, if you look at Judges chapter 6, verse 34 to verse 35, quickly. It says, but the spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon. I don't know what the other versions say. You know, sometimes you can never do these things in your own flesh. You need the power of God. Things don't happen by just because you, you, it's you who is doing it. And there are moments when we begin to imagine it is us who have done it. It says the spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. My translation in the, in the, in, in, in the, in, in the living Bible, it says the spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon. As this man was there after the angel had spoken to him, suddenly the spirit of God came upon him. And I'm sure this is what the church needs now. I want to invite you to our conference. It's going to be powerful. One of the things I'm going to trust God for the conference is the power of the Holy Spirit. Because we cannot continue living, doing things in the flesh. Let me tell you, we can organize ourselves, we can be smart, we can run programs, we can do things in a systematic manner, but without the Holy Ghost, listen to me, without the Holy Ghost, we will have, I spoke about quality and what? We shall have quantity, but no what? Quality. And we don't, God is not banking on Quantity. He's banking on what? I'm glad you're getting my sermon. Tell your friend you, you've gotten it. Yeah, you've gotten it. It's not banking on... You know those things confuse my mind when I want to speak. But it's banking on what? Quality. That's what we did in GCI. This is why we call this church a church of what? Excellence. And please don't compromise quanti quality. Huh? And what? Good. All right. So what happened? I have 10 minutes to go. Let me finish this. It says this. The Spirit of God came upon Gideon, and he sounded a trumpet. Sounded a trumpet. This is where synergy comes in. Sounded a, a trumpet, and the, and the eb, eb, help me here, the what? Ebe what? Eb, 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 Ebrezites were called out to follow him. This was a special squad of people that were men of war. That's what I discovered. They followed him. And then there was some, I mean, the Bible tells me, and he sent messengers throughout all where? Manasseh. And, two, and they too were called to follow him. And he sent messengers to where? Asher and where? Zablon and where? Naphtali. And they went up to meet with him. That is what we call synergy. And we can never defeat the devil without what? Synergy. You know, we need one another. Just like our topic here has been in Judah say to Simeon. He said, come up with me to my allotted territory that we may fight against the Canaanite. And I will likewise go with you to your allotted territory. Synergy never ceased with Joshua. It never ceased. This man understood if you're going to make an assault on the devil, we must combine our effects and GCI, listen to me. If you're going to make it in life, don't fight the war alone. You know the reason why many of us go into trouble? We never share even our concerns with other people. Especially in families. Don't fight your, your, your war alone. In your business, don't fight your war alone. In, your, in, in whatever thing God is giving you to do, don't allow yourself to just fight that war alone. The Spirit of God was upon Gideon. Gideon would have simply said, God, if your Spirit is upon me, then just do something. Or just use these people that I, 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 I have with me, or just work a miracle somehow. But he had to call out four tribes. And what happened? Listen what happened. When he called out those four tribes, the, the Bible tells me, and they came and they followed him. They came up to meet him. Okay, to me, this was really success. Very, very good success. I will give you the numbers. What a success campaign that was. Israel came out in large numbers. We can see the tribe of Manasseh, the tribe of Asher, 
the tribe of Zebulon, the tribe of Naphtali, and then of course these fellows called the Abazarites. All these guys, they came together and they were, I'll give you the figure, they were actually 32,000 men that signed up for war. But again, compare 32,000 to how many people that were in the valley? 135,000. I think in my opinion, I would still say that figure is too small to fight that, uh, that, that army. In my opinion, I would say, Lord, maybe I should call for more reinforcements from other places. But listen, God does not, synergy is not in numbers. It's not in numbers. You know, even in church like this, some people may think it's because we are many or we have numbers, then we can do whatever. It's not. It's not. I've come to discover as a pastor, there are only a few men and a few women in church who seriously fight the wars. Many come and just sit. When, when you see them sitting, they look like they are very powerful. Turn to your neighbor, ask him, how powerful are you? <laughs> Even when they carry themselves, you believe they have come with millions of shillings to come and help build a sheepfold. But you find somebody who is very frail, a little girl, like a one of the wonderful girls who have been singing to us here. She has, she, has, she has refused to eat her lunch. She has come with those few shillings to give for the sheepfold. But this man who has arrived with a pajero, and he's sitting, he's watching the pastor. Because synergy is not in what? Tell your friend it's not in numbers. No, no, be very serious. I know some of you are not very serious about this. Tell them it's not in numbers. Now listen, listen, listen to me here. There was something lacking in that synergy. Those men who came, something was lacking in them. Which God was looking for to fulfill his purpose through Gideon. He saw the, the numbers came. But when God looked down, he realized, uh -uh, although these, men are, these people are many, 32,000, uh, there is still something in this man which is actually lacking. And God was, he wanted to look for that thing that was lacking. What was lacking in, those thing, uh, in the people was not that there were not many. There was something inherent in them, something inside of them, which God was trying to look for. And I can tell you, synergy is when the effect, he was looking for the effect that is in the lives of those men for the purposes of fulfilling what he wanted to do through Gideon. And that effect was not the quantity of the people. It was the quality of the people. And I want to say to people in this church this morning, I think God is looking for quality members. Let me speak something to the first service. I believe you are the most quality people in this church. If you can leave your bed in the morning, 7 o'clock and you are here, I can bank on you. Pastor Joyce, can we bank on this man and this woman? Because I believe if you can leave your bed at 6, at unakuja kanisani, unacha buwana yako, unacha bibi yako nyumba. I think that man, that woman is very serious. And we can believe, we can bank on you. So what was it? Quality, listen to me, let me define the, these two terms, quality and quantity. Then in five minutes, I'll make, make my submissions. Quality is the extent, size, or sum of something. That is what you call us quantity, sorry, quantity. It's the extent, the size, and the sum of something. It is countable or measurable and can be expressed as a numerical value. Tukowengi. You know, pastors have a, have, have a problem. When you meet another pastor, you ask, how is your church? How many are you? Because they believe when you say there are so many, you've made it. But let me tell you, you can only have 15 people, but you're making then somebody who has millions of people, but they're just there to vomit and do all types of things. <laughs> now, quality, listen, quality, quality. This, these are dictionary meanings, and I want you to go and check out yourself. Quantity is the extent, the size, or the sum of something. It is countable, measurable, and can be expressed as a numerical figure. You can't dispute to go wink. But let's go to Let's go to quality. Quality, I think, I, th I, think, I think we have a mix up there. Can we go to qu qu quality is what? Quality is... So, so. I think I missed the two. There is, there is quality and quantity. Quantity, you mix the two. We mix the two. Quantity, please correct there. Quantity, quantity now. That should be 
quantity is is the extent, the size, or the sum. Or, or it is countable and measurable. Can we go now to go to quality? Change there. Right quality. No, the, the, the next one. Quality. My, my friends upstairs. Quality. No, quantity now. Qua quality, yeah? Quality. Let's go to quality. Quality. Okay? Remove that. Is that quantity? Quality now. There is a mistake there. There is a, I know you're taking my notes. There's just a, a mix-up. Change that, put that, call that what? Quantity. Then the other one, change it and call it what? Quality. All right? Let me read what is here. All right? It is, on the other hand, a measure of excellence or of a state of being. It is, describes something either of how it was made or how it is compared to others. I think you have that in your notes. All right? Have you gotten it? Yes. All right? Now listen. It is when we talk about quality, not quantity. We are talking about a measure of what? Excellence. A measure of excellence. We are talking about the extent of, we are talking about a state of being of what something is, either how it is made or how it is compared to others. When we say the quality of this thing is high, it means you are excellent. That's what quality is. But quantity is simply sum. A sum. A sum. Now, what was God looking for here? Let me just go straight to my, my message here. God is looking for characteristics. He's looking for characteristics or futures of something or, some, or someone rather than the extent and the size or the sum of someone or something. God is interested in quality, not in quantity. He's not looking for how many we are, but he's looking at the the extent of what you are and, 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 and the excellence that is in you. That's what God is looking for. That's the reason why when this man gathered, God looked down and he realized, ah, uh -uh, there is something wrong here. Now, it is the characteristics or the future of someone or something that produced the effects and not the extent or the size of a person or the sum of something. Let me repeat that statement. In, qual in quality... We have the characteristics in quality. We have characteristics. In quantity, we have the sum. I'm making it easy now here. Let me repeat. In quality, we have the characteristics of that thing. But in, qual in, in quantity, we have the sum. Now, God is not interested in the sum. He's interested in what? Characteristic effect that is there. Because it is the effect of two people that produces a much higher return than when you do it alone. What did God do in conclusion? Look at this. The Bible tells me despite the 32,000 men that had volunteered up and signed up for the, from the tribes of uh, the four tribes that uh, Gideon had called upon to synergize with him, God was looking for quality rather than quantity for that assignment which was there. So what was God looking for in this? Synergy there for six people with the characteristic effect that will produce results more than the sum of people that normally present themselves. I'll give an example. We can have thousands of people in this church, but 90%, turn to your neighbor, tell him 90%, useless. I know you didn't know I'm going to say that. And only 10% tell your neighbor, only 10% useful. Can I change now the equation? Now I want you to smile as you turn to your neighbor. Tell him we can have a church like this one. With 90% wonderful people. 
But only 10. Useless. So ask him which category do you belong to. Now let me run. Pastor Joe is three minutes. I stop. Let me run through three things that God was looking for in this man. Remember there are 32,000. Again, it's how many people? 135. 130? 35. Now look. God was looking, number one, for men who understand synergy calls for courageous men. Courageous. In other words, listen, even if it doesn't cost you, even if it's not going to cost you something, you must do something. It calls for you to go above your fears. The times, the times when something will be demanded of you in synergy, that you will realize if I do it, I might not have anything to do with myself. The spirit of fear will come and tell you, if you try this, it will not work. But God is telling you, listen, I'm looking for men who will look at the numbers of those armies down there. And they will say, despite the numbers of those armies, the Bible describes them when you read, they were like locusts. How many of you have seen locusts on a tree? How does a, lo a tree look like when it has locusts? Can you approach that tree if there were bees on a tree? And the whole tree is full of bees. I think it takes a courageous man to go with a stick on a tree that is full of bees. And you begin doing what? Removing the bees. So the Lord was saying, listen, this man who are gathered down there were so many that there was no way 32,000 men would go there in their numbers and defeat them without the quality of people that I'm looking for who will defy all odds and allow me, because of their position and their characteristic, to use them for that purpose. Let me repeat myself here. Sometimes God will use you not because you are very special, but simply because you have chosen to allow him to use you through what you have in you. And look at what he did. Number one, courageous people. Judges chapter 7 verse 3. I'll run through them. 7, 3, it says, the Lord now says, Now therefore, proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, those now 32,000, in the ears of the people, saying, whoever, help me here, whoever is what? Can you blow that so that the people can read it? Whoever is fearful, and the what? Please blow this. My, 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 my picture is not important. Just put that. Who, proclaim in the hearing of the people, saying, whoever is what? Fearful and afraid, let him turn and depart at once from Mount Gilead. Then he says, and what? 22,000 of the people returned and 20,000 remained. How many remained? 10,000. Now, the Lord understood. Some of them who had come, they had just come but in their hearts. Can you imagine you are coming to church but you are just, you know? You are just there. Let me just go because pastor has called us. Then when you look down there, you see, 30, you see 350 men. What do you think is going to happen to you? Fear. That's why when, when they call Mandamano, you don't go. And I'll tell you don't go. Because you will look at those men with the, those elements and that thing which is, uh, they call it what? Tear gas. And I'm sure when you just see it, ah, I'm in a Rudy pipeline. <laughs> now, the Lord said, listen, if you are fearful, in other words, God is not going to use you if you are a fearful person. God is looking for men who are what? Help me here. Courageous. People who will look at the enemy and they will know, surely this is an enemy. Although he's an enemy, I will defy all odds to fight the enemy. And if this year is going to move the next level, we must decide to be courageous. Because where we are going is not going to be cheap, by the way. Money will not become more, Pastor Joyce. Inflation will go up. But that does not stop you from giving tithe. Don't your neighbor tell him, I will do what the Lord has told me to do. I know you will say that one pastor will preach because he wants money. I'm telling you the truth. If you want to, if you want to overcome inflation in this country, and you want God to give you a premium. You must just do what God is telling you to do without fear. But if you're going to be afraid, oh, you know, pastor, things are not working for me. I have this to do. I'm afraid if I do this, this will happen. I can tell you, you are not worthy synergizing in the church. And believe me, 22,000 just took off. Now we're remaining with the 10 again is how many? Okay, let's move on. Point number two, quickly. Point number two is here. God wants to use tested people. Tested people. 
Why tested? Look at, at Judges chapter four, 7 and verse 4. 7 verse 4. It says, then the Lord said to Gideon. Can you, by the way, there are now 10,000. God, this God is a very interesting God. He says, can you blow it up? People upstairs, blow it up. Use, use something which people can read. Okay? Use my word. My, my, easy, easy worship, if you can. But the Lord said to Gideon, listen to me, after 22 are gone. He says, the people are what? Now, you believe me, believe me. 300, how many, how, how many are down there? 100 and what? And how many are you having? And the man is saying there are still too many. Bring them down to the water and I will test them for you there. Then it will be that of whom I say to you, this one shall go with you. The same shall go with you. And of whomsoever I say to you, this one shall not go with you. The same, the same shall not go. So Gideon tells them, now come. He takes them to the river. And he says, now, and you know they're carrying their guns. They've been given their guns. I came, I was researching to find out what God was testing here. And I realized that I may, I may be wrong here or I may be right. But that's what I, 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 was, I, I, I discovered. You are not, if you're a policeman, you are not supposed to put your gun down. Especially in public. Am I saying the truth? Naeka gun hapa nataka kukula. Weke gun chini, alafu kai kwa mezo unakula. And you are a policeman. What is going to happen to you? If there is an enemy, what will he do? He'll take, take the gun and shoot you. This is why a policeman doesn't put his gun down. If you check, it is hanging here. He's holding it. Even when he's eating, it is here on the lap. So what happened here? They are carrying the spear, they are carrying that. They are carrying, actually, that time they didn't have guns. They're having spears and they're having the whatever. The Lord tells them, go to the water. And he made each one of them so thirsty. But your God can make you thirsty. You can leave this church when you are so thirsty. Fikri una homa. Kumbe hauna. Kumbe God is just testing you. He says, when they reach the river, each one of them says, I must drink the water. There are some fellows who decided to put their guns aside. They put their guns aside. Like that. Then they began taking the water with their hands. to drink. But there are fellows who decided, if this is the ground, they were holding their guns and they were doing what? <laughs> that was the test. The test was, if you are a soldier, do you understand the ethics of fighting? If you are a soldier, do you know that you must hold on your weapon and fight? And as they were doing that, the Lord was separating. Once, one leaks, All right? You know, there are people who come to church, they really, they really, they even the eyes can just tell you, he's, he's telling the usher, you are useless. He, he wants to go and sit in the position that he likes. Sorry, sorry, I'm using the ushers. Don't know that I've reported you. I hope you're not the one. Now, listen, God was testing them to find out what it is. I was looking at the word test. Test simply means trial, experiment. It simply means an examination that is designed to determine the qualities or characteristics of someone or something. When you are being tested, they want to find out who you are. And every test you go through, God wants to find out who you are. Tell your friend, don't be afraid of testing. By the way, even Jesus was tested. He was not tempted, he was tested. So that God can be able to bring out the best that was in him. And every believer must go through some kind of testing. The question is, will you pass the test or will you not pass the test? Now listen, as a child of God in GCI, we need men who will pass the test. And by the way, test is nothing. I came to realize is when test is when you are tempted. Can tell somebody tempted. Tempted is this. You are on the street and a beautiful girl just passes. All right? Now the test is what will you do? The first look is accepted, but the second one, you, you, you fail the test. If, if you look again and now you turn and you, then you are not worth being a member of GCI. Test, testing is when there is money and you, are, you don't have money in your pockets. And you have been given an assignment and money is coming through your hands. Are you going to take the money or not? Testing is when your friends take you out there and they tell you, can you drink a bit here? Testing is when somebody comes and tells you, can, you, can I have a date with you? Those are the testings. God wants to find out to bring out the truth of you. 
we'll be talking about that. But can you be trusted for synergy? If you are this kind of a person who does not pass the test, how can we trust you to go on the battlefield? You know, I said, synergy is not in what? And my next message will be Akan. Akan. There was synergy. But there was only one man called who? What did Akan do? Okay, let's leave it for now. Number three and the last one. The last one is this. God is looking for obedient, obedient people. Obedient people. And you'll find this in Judges chapter 7, verse 9 to verse 11. Please forgive me for taking 10 of your minutes. Pastor Joyce will know how he'll recover it. Because this first service, we have no issues with the interchange with the second one. Pastor Joyce will know how to recover that. Is that okay? Second service, I promise you, I'll finish on time. Okay. <laughs> But allow me to say this. Chapter 7, verse 9 to 11. If I leave it hanging, you will not get it. 7 to 9. What does it say? It happened on the same night. The Lord said to him, arise, go against the camp. I have delivered it into your hand. Okay? Can we go to verse, verse what? Let's keep on verse 10 and 11. Okay? 10. But if you are afraid to go down, go down to the camp with Pura, your servant. Verse 11. Okay? And you will, shall hear what they say. And afterwards, your hands shall be strengthened to go down against the camp. Then he went down with Pura, his servant, to the outposts of the armed men who were in the camp. Now, I want to cut, my, uh, to cut myself here. You'll go and read in details. Now, that very night, God told Gideon, now you go to the camp where those men are. Just go to the camp. Because he knew even Gideon himself, even as the leader, there was still in him. He was also wondering, now I have only... 300 people. By the way, I didn't finish that statement. After they had been tested, you know how many people disappeared? Help me. How many disappeared? 9,700. Now you have remained with how many? Only these men who are sitting here. Well, let me make up and you are the back. Out of a church of 22,000, you only have how many members? 300. Those are the ones who are supposed now to build the sheepfolds. Even Pastor Mlema will wonder. I'll be looking at the cost of that sheepfold and wondering, can this 300 do? But there's something special about the 300. Are you here listening to me? Those people have quality, but not what? Quantity. Are you one of them? Turn to your neighbor, ask him, are you one of them? So in my opinion, this is my opinion, when Gideon looked at what now the numbers that he has, and he knows God told him, now you go to the, just go, some, just go to the edge of the camp and look into the camp and see who are there. Gideon was afraid in his heart. Of course, not the, the, the fear that I spoke about in chapter, in, on courage. He's a courageous man, but inside he's wondering, can it really work for me with 300? So the Lord told Gideon, listen, I will encourage you. That's why the Bible says, there and you shall be done what? Strengthened. So I'm telling you, even when nothing is on your plate and you're wondering and fear is beginning to draw, there is a word for you. Amen. Tell your friend there is a word for you. Ah, uh -uh, listen to me. Tell your friend Mungu ataongea. <laughs> How did God do it? Akamambia Gideon, if you are, you just go and check and see. And I know you are fearful because you even know that you know what you are doing. So Gideon went with, and he told him, take your servant, go with you, and you will hear what they will be saying. So people are in the valley, and there were people on the outpost. Outposts are on the on, on the outskirts. Okay, members of the team that's down in the valley. As Gideon was there, he had somebody speak. And someone was giving a, a dream that he had had. And in that dream, he said to his neighbor, he was telling his neighbor, yesterday I dreamt, and the dream was like this. Someone was cooking, was cooking bread, and the bread tipped from the, the pot. It went down into the camp of the Midianites and hit the camp. And after hitting the camp, the camp fell flat, and everything went flat. Bread, can you imagine bread? Not stone, bread. Then this other one interpretationally told him, actually what you are saying is Gideon will come and he'll destroy the whole camp. And Gideon is listening. So when Gideon heard that, he knew it's the Lord who is telling him what? The same. You can go and read the story. Gideon stood up and he says, wow. He's hearing from the enemy saying that interpretation of that word is that Gideon is coming to destroy us. And that's exactly what happened. Look at this verse in conclusion. Chapter, verse 12 to verse 17. And I'm done. Can you stand up on your feet as we, we read this one? 12 to 13. Okay? 
Worship team, please come. 12 to 13. It says this. It says, and the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the people of the east lay along the valley like locusts. That's how they were, like locusts. All the people, they were like locusts, numerous like locusts, and their camels were without number, as the sand of the seashore in multitude. These are the people 300 men are going to confront. And when Gideon had come there, there was a man telling a dream to a companion. He said, I have had a dream. To my surprise, a loaf of bread tumbled into the cup of the media, and it came to a tent and struck it so that it fell and overturned, and the tent collapsed. Now listen. Look at verse, 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 verse 7. And Gideon had, and, and, when, and when Gideon had come there, I think I've read that. Look at verse 14. 14, please. Then his command, companion answered and said, this is nothing else. Can you read with me? This is what? Nothing else but what? The sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel, into his hands God has delivered media and the whole camp. Now go to verse 15. 15. 15. And so it was when Gideon had, I, I like that word, the telling of the dream and his interpretation, that he worshipped. He returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has delivered the land, the camp of the media, into your. And believe me, 300 men killed 32, 130,000 men. 100 and what? 35,000 men. Can I stop there? Mungo Abarik. Ask your neighbor, who are you? Ask him, is it quality or quantity? Lift up your hands and just, Father, thank you. Bless your people, each one of them that are here present. Lord, just help us to see what you can do. Let not the glory be to any man. Let not us believe it is our numbers. Let us not believe it is our strength. But Father, help us to know it is only you that has the power. It's only you that gives us the strength. It's only you that creates in us such a quality, such a characteristic, such a feature. The Lord can, can turn the world upside down. Lord, help us to know it is not in numbers that you give us victory. It is in obedience. Obedience. When we hear the word of God, we are encouraged. Teach us your word, Lord. Give us the spirit that will help us. Lord, not only to focus on our problems, but to focus on you, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Lord, if there is somebody here who is going through trouble, touch that one and deliver him. Deliver her, Lord. Somebody who is fearful, take away the fear. Lord, somebody here, Father, who is thinking it is all over, ask, let that person know with God all things are possible. Somebody who was almost giving up because of the economy, because of the situation in his home, family, probably business or whatever it is, let them know there is power in the name of Jesus. And there is nothing impossible with God. Father, give us the abilities to know it is not by our numbers. It is not by the many monies we have. It is by the faith we have in you to believe in you, Lord Jesus. Let your word speak clearly into our ears like it did in the ears of Jesus. When the devil tempted him, he said, it is written. Give us your word, Lord, in this situation that we may know that the enemy is defeated. We thank you and we bless you. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Pastor Joyce.